This is a presentation for the Winnipeg Philatelic Society, Western Canada's oldest stamp club. And the topic is what to collect, what stamps should I collect? Now, of course, the first rule of stamp collecting is you should collect anything you want. But after that, um, we need to understand a little bit how your collecting is going to be affected by the catalog and how your collecting is going to be affected by the album you pick. So the catalog. And catalogs changes and differ. And here are three stamps. And they are an example of how catalogs differ. So, for instance, in the Scott catalog, these are cataloged as semi-postal stamps, and I've got the catalog numbers there. In Hiver, which is the French catalog, and seeing these are French stamps, you would think that the French catalog knew better. They are calculate, uh, cataloged as normal postage stamps. They're in just in the normal series. And in Stanley Gibbons, they are also cataloged in the normal series. So when you're deciding what to collect, are you going to collect just the normal stamps in the catalog? Or are you going to collect back of the book stamps, which in Scott, these are back of the book? You need to think a little bit about what you're going to do, and that's your call. And the if you use a pre-printed album, the pre-printed album will make that decision for you and decide whether these are in the pre-printed album and if you don't decide to collect them you're going to have blank spot in your album if you have a, uh, a blank album blank sheets you can do whatever you want now just to tell you about these stamps these were um, case d'amortissement stamps used to repay the french debt um, from the first world war and they were issued between 1927 and 1931 you will see they conveniently add to 50 centimes, 75 centimes, and 2 francs. And you'll see that the first three series, based on their catalog value, and remember you're going to pay less than catalog if you buy on eBay or from a dealer. The first three series were reasonably well used. People bought them and used them. The last two series, when they uh, no longer used Pasteur and... Uh, used all three with La Semeuse, have higher catalog values. And you may decide, if you're using a uh, blank album, you may decide that you're just not going to have those. You'll have the first three series and not the last two. The other interesting thing, seeing we're talking about interesting stuff in stamp collecting, is many of these stamps were, while there was a 40-cent La Semeuse stamp, it wasn't necessarily issued originally in blue um, or green or the Pasteur in orange. Not necessarily. Sometimes they reprinted the stamp in a different color and then overprinted it. And for instance, the 150 Pasteur was blue and reprinted orange, rose, and brown. And there never was a 150 La Semouse stamp, so they engraved that specially for the purpose of overprinting it. That's just interesting, and that interest may impact what you collect. So as I said, Scott considers these things back of the book. They're semi-postal stamps, and they, ca they catalog all semi-postal stamps as back of the book stamps. They're with airmail stamps, which they have a C prefix, and postage due stamps. And as I said, Iver and Stanley Gibbons just considers them normal stamps and would only have, for instance, the postage due stamps as back-of-the-book stamps because technically they're not stamps. If you put a postage due stamp on a letter to mail it, it wouldn't go. Here's another example of, example of how um, catalogs change. Here I have a 1958 Scott catalog. I find that kind of interesting. Somebody gave it to me. And you will see down at the bottom in the left corner there we have uh, the Arche de Triomphe and we have uh, they've pictured the five centime stamp and the stamps go from five up and there are two series the second series had 
the Arc de Triomphe and the value printed in black. And you will see these are cataloged as occupation stamps. And if you read there, it says issued jointly by the Allied Military Government of the United States and Great Britain for civilian use in France. And they're not considered French stamps. And they're cataloged 2N1 to 2N20. Now, now in Scott, they are 475, 476, 476A to H, and 522A to J. And in the Scott catalog, if they decide that they've missed a stamp and they wish to indicate that it's a different stamp, it's a issued stamp, they put a capital letter. If they put a sm lowercase letter, then it's considered to be a variety. So 476 small a is a variety of 476. 476 a is a completely different stamp from 476. If you look in your current Scott catalog, or sorry, if you looked in the 58 Scott catalog, there was a 474 and a 477. So they were able to squeeze in 475 and 476, but not the A to H. And 522, it went from 522 to 523, so they had to squeeze them in. Now, Iver and Gibbons just have cataloged those in the normal series. And what happened here was these stamps were printed in the United States. And they were issued by the Allied government in France as they uh, moved up from Marseille and in from Normandy. And you have to reestablish the mail system right away. And you'll see this happens many times when wars change who's in charge of a country. The stamps sort of immediately change. Well, of course, the Allied military government was made up of the British and the Americans and the Canadians and the Australians and the New Zealanders and the French under de Gaulle. And de Gaulle had something to say about this. And de Gaulle said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. These are not, these are French stamps. Um, we, the free French, are taking control of France as you are friendly allies. Take it back for us, and we really appreciate that. But these are French stamps. So you can see in 1958, and that's, I guess, more than 10 years after the war, but Scott initially cataloged these as back-of-the-book stamps and in France occupation stamps. And later they changed their mind and said, no, okay, we now understand. These were issued by the French government. Um, and, of course, during, um, in this period of time, there were two French governments. There was the Vichy government sort of under the influence of the Nazis. And there was the Free French government moving up from the south and moving in from Normandy. So, as I said, de Gaulle, who was a very forceful guy, very interesting guy, he had something to say about whether or not these were French stamps or not. So even though they were printed in the United States, they are now considered, by the catalogs at least, to be French stamps. And the point in this being, I found this very interesting because I could never understand why these stamps were 522A to J. I didn't get it. Um, and the reason was that initially they were cataloged not as French stamps, and later that changed. So catalogs change. So here are two examples, the 1944 and 1945 values. Um, as I say, the, the catalog numbers changed. The uh, values changed too. You can see it went from five centimes to 30 centimes. Uh, I guess we had inflation. But the catalog value of these is pretty low. Mint and used 20 to 30 cents. So they were common. Lots of them got used. Lots of them were printed and lots of them were used. Now, the other thing about catalogs changing, uh, Machen stamps, which I find quite interesting, Great, uh, Great Britain. How many of them are there really? Well, in the Stanley Gibbons catalog, they stayed in the normal sequence until we got to 1971. And in 1971, they got an X in front of them, X841, and it went all the way up to X1058. And they kind of stayed in the normal numbering sequence. 
So there was an 840 um, stamp, and when they assigned 841, they put an X in front of it because it was a Machen. And they sort of say in the normal sequence, from 1993 to 2006, there were, they were the Y sequence, and you can see the numbers there. 2007 to 2020, the U sequence, and between 2021 and 22, the V series. Now, Gibbons doesn't capture all of the Machens this way. There are other what I consider to be Machens that are not included in this series and are outside the series. So if you're trying to decide that you want to collect all the Machen stamps, which is quite a tall order, the Gibbons numbering sequence won't help you. Scott, after a while, changed, and they started at MH1. That was the first um, pound, shilling, and pence Machen. And it goes up to 518 um, with the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Now, what helped me was a site called adminware.ca, a really neat site. If you're interested in, interested in Machen's and want to understand it in its simplest form, there are 307 face different Machen's as far as they're concerned. There are 518 in Gibbons, so there's some difference here. They have 1,506 images, and there are actually way more when you consider printers and uh, the sort of hidden printing on the back, the security print. If you are really specialized, you get the Degum catalog, and it's now too big to print. It's now only on CD. There are so many different machins, printers, and this and that and the other. So. You have an interesting challenge. I did when I was trying to figure out which of the Machens I wanted to have in my collection. And I, I sort of wanted just the face different. And I went, I've got a little more than 307, um, but I certainly don't have 1,506. Um, and so that's how I figured that out because I find the catalog very difficult to understand. And the adminware.ca site, a really great site for Machens. And there are many others, but it just happens to be my favorite. And it's run by a guy from Winnipeg, or Manitoba at least. Now then the other question you're going to come to is souvenir sheets. Am I going to collect souvenir sheets? Now these are often expensive, so that may be one of the reasons you decide not to. Are you going to collect only mint souvenir sheets, the complete souvenir sheet mint? Are you going to collect used souvenir sheets, the complete souvenir sheet used? Are you going to collect the used stamps from the souvenir sheet? Um, that was kind of possible in Canada for a while because enough people used uh, bought a souvenir sheet um, and used the stamps from the souvenir sheet to mail letters. So you could, if you got enough used stamps, you could find used souvenir sheet stamps. And then the other thing, of course, is if you're using a pre-printed album, does the pre-printed album include a space for it or not? Um, my pre-printed French album includes a space for a really expensive souvenir sheet from the early 1900s in France. And I kind of looked at it. And actually what they do is they, you could only buy the stamps in the souvenir sheet. And what they've done is they have space for the two stamps from the souvenir sheet. So if you, in fact, had the souvenir sheet, you would not, in your wildest dreams, take the two stamps out because it would completely destroy the value of your souvenir sheet. Um, so I decided in my French album, A, they're expensive, and B, I'm not going to buy a souvenir sheet and break it apart to get the two stamps I need. So I tend not to collect souvenir sheets, but... Some people, that's their favorite part of collecting. And if you collect Great Britain, um, the UK, um, they have a souvenir sheet now with every commemorative issue. So you could decide to collect nothing but uh, Great Britain souvenir sheets. Now, your attitude, my attitude, is the, are, are these souvenirs for non-collectors? And that's kind of my attitude. Um, are they stamps for your collection? Some people say, yes, that's what I collect. I collect souvenir sheets of Canada. Um, uh, I consider them to be stamps for collectors of souvenir sheets. 
Um, it's up to you. Uh, what I think is irrelevant, you decide. Now the album you pick, pre-printed or blank pages. And I use both. So um, sometimes I've decided to use one and sometimes I've decided to use the other. So does a pre-printed album decide for you what stamps you're going to collect? And the answer is yes. There's a spot in the album. You kind of are motivated to go and uh, get it. Um, blank pages, you decide yourself what you're going to get. Does it include unwanted stamps? And yes, a pre-printed album will. It will include a spot for souvenir sheets, for example. Blank pages, again, it's up to you. Will it exclude wanted stamps? And it might, because maybe you want to collect souvenir sheets and there's no spot in the pre-printed album for it. What's more work? Well, it's much easier to use a pre-printed album. All the stamps are there. It's much easier to figure out where they go. If you have to, if you have blank pages, you have to take the stamp and sort through the catalog. And depending on the catalog you're using, they may not necessarily have a picture of your stamp. And even if they do, finding where the stamp is and what it is and where it goes, it's a lot of fun looking for it in the catalog. Um, what costs more? Well, the pre-printed albums, particularly if you get ones with um, uh, the mounting things uh, in them already, those are quite expensive. Blank pages uh, are cheaper, but they're still not cheap. Um, does a pre-printed album help with the layout of stamps? Yes, it does. Um, blank pages, again, it's up to you. The number of stamps you can put on per page, and this is one of the things that I find I dislike about pre-printed pre -printed albums, because they lay them out very artistically, and they have four or five or six stamps per page, which means that you get a lot of pages um, per year, and means you have to buy albums more frequently. Um, if you're doing it yourself, you can decide to put as many stamps as you want on the page. And someone might decide that it's not artistic and you decide I'm doing it for me, I don't care. How long do you have to wait? Um, well, you have to wait for the publisher when the pre-printed album, you have to every year buy a new set of annual pages and if you miss them, then it's hard to get. You just have to buy the whole album. And then eventually you have to buy another album and start putting pages in it. Blank pages, you can do at any time. You can, as soon as the year is over, if you think you've got enough of the stamps of the year to put in, you can put them in. And are there other considerations for both of these? Sure. Now, the United States now issues 120 stamps a year around, sometimes more, sometimes less which means you're going to have 15 or perhaps more pre-printed pages. If you're using blank pages, maybe four pages. So significant difference in the number of pages per year. Now, fun with the catalog. As I said, it can be fun looking up stamps and finding out what they are. The other warning I have is often in older stamps, you look it up, you look up your stamp, and you go, oh, look at that. This stamp has a catalog value of $300. And when I do that, I go, well, you know, I'm going to bet that I don't have that stamp. So you keep looking, and you go, oh, there's a, another series with a different watermark, and then there's another series with different perforation, and then there's another series with slightly different printing. And, oh, look, the one I have is, in fact, worth $0.25, cents, um, because that first series it was worth a hundred or two hundred dollars just didn't print a lot not a lot survived and they continued with the same design for a number of years and I've got the one that's worth 20 cents so my theory normally is oh well I've got the one that's worth 20 cents big deal so stamps and history and the history we learned in high school and collecting French stamps has showed to me how much more complicated French history was than I had learned in high school. And I guess my understanding of French history from high school is terribly incomplete. So these are two stamps I have. The one on the left is from Alsace. It was issued by Germany under the German occupation of Alsace-Lorraine. 
The stamp on the right is what's called the Bordeaux issue of French stamps. During the Franco-Prussian War, German forces surrounded Paris. Nothing could get in or out, so they could no longer print stamps in Paris. So the printing of stamps had to move to Bordeaux. And so this is referred to as the Bordeaux issue of French stamps. And the other interesting thing is war doesn't stop the need for people to mail letters. So if there's a war, printing's not that hard. Um, very quickly, the occupying force produces stamps to be used so people can mail letters. So the results of the Franco-Prussian War, and there were lots of things that happened because of the Franco-Prussian War, but it resulted in the unification of the German Empire. Germany, up until that point, had been a bunch of separate kingdoms, and if you collect German stamps, there are all kinds of different German stamps from Prussia and Brunswick and all kinds of German stamps. It was a, uh, a number of kingdoms and they all issued their own stamps. So after 1870 it got unified. It resulted in the fall of Napoleon III who was the cousin of Napoleon. He went into exile in Great Britain. He was captured. Um, in one of the battles because he was leading his forces and was captured. It resulted in Al Alsace-Lorraine being transferred to, Germ to Germany. Uh, at the end of World War I, they went back to France. One of the reasons for World War II, many reasons, was for Germany to get Alsace-Lorraine back. And there are a lot of German speakers that live in Alsace-Lorraine. Um, if you understand French history before uh, the issue of stamps. The borders of France moved all over the place. France occupied Britain, 1066. Uh, Britain occupied France um, in various times. Germany, the German borders moved back and forth across France. So historically, what we now consider France wasn't. The, the European borders moved around a lot. But the impact it had on stamps is we can see we issued a stamp for Alsace-Lorraine under German occupation, and we issued the Bordeaux issue. Um, the Alsace stamp is France cataloged in Scott as N6, has a catalog value of $17.50, but sells for $4 on eBay. The uh, Bordeaux issue, those are sometimes hard to get. There weren't that many of them used. It's France number 42, Scott, and it has catalog value of $60, but again, sells for $10 on eBay. And then other interesting stamps. So at first blush, this that's Queen Victoria. Looks a lot like a lot of British stamps I have, so I assume it's a stamp of Great Britain. Well, no, if we look at it closely. And it's easier to see now you've got it magnified here. It's from Mauritius, which is... I had originally thought it was in the Caribbean, but no, it's in the Indian Ocean. It was at various times under French or British control. And so when Queen Victoria was queen, it was British, and there's the stamp. So always interesting to look these up in the catalog, find a bit about it. Ponta Delgada, never heard of it before. We see from the cancellation that it appears to be uh, a telephone or telegraph cancel. So may this stamp may not have been used postally. It's a nice cancellation. September 1894, quite clear. But where the heck is Ponta Delgada? Well, it's Portuguese, and it's in the Azores. Okay, didn't know that. So these two are obviously stamps of Spain, except when we look more closely, we see one is of Puerto Rico, and one is of the Philippines. Um, and it's actually a newspaper stamp. And... This is a very young-looking king, and it's Alfonso XIII, who was born in 1866 and was king until 1931. He was king at birth. His father had died the year before he was born, but the queen was pregnant, so they knew they were going to have a child of some kind. So at birth, he became king. He died at age 54. And if you understand Spanish history, which I don't terribly well, but he was the last king of Spain. 
And they have other stamps of Alfonso the Thirteenth when he's more grown up. But this is him as a, effectively a baby. So if you're a stamp collector, what do you end up collecting? Well, the catalog influences and which catalog you use influences it. The album you use influences it. Your interests influences it. What you think are interesting stamps influences it. But in the end, you decide. So thanks for listening.